introduce um, Daniel Kramer. He himself won a Fulbright uh, to Germany as a student. Uh, he is the director of the Fulbright U.S. Student Program uh, that is housed at the International it, sorry, Institute of International Education in New York City. He graduated from St. John's and St. Ben's. He also uh, completed a PhD in Germanic uh, languages and literature from Harvard before taking teaching posts at the Holy Cross College and Washington and Lee University. He has been the recipient of numerous awards and he's very passionate about the Fulbright uh, program. He's also led many uh, students directly on trips to Germany. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to him. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, some of you, um, when they hear that, think, OK, this is a great opportunity. I just want to remind everybody, I come from a tiny town of less than 200 in rural Minnesota by Walnut Grove, Little House on the Prairie, Laura Ingalls Wilder. Does that, does that mean anything to anybody still today? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm a firm believer, if Fulbright can find me, it can find anybody. Uh, and I'm a, also a firm believer that there's a Fulbrighter or Fulbright Fulbrighters on every campus across the country. And so it's great for me to be here. Um, it's, it's just been a real pleasure to be able to work with Middle Tennessee State. Um, Laura came up to New York a couple of times. We've provided some training for her. We've learned a lot from her as well. And um, it's been wonderful because without uh, the input that we get from the campuses, we can't improve the program. So some of the Fulbright program advisors that came were part of a study group uh, a focus group that met with the de uh, deputy assistant secretary that helped us change some of the, the nomenclature and some of the, the ways in which we've improved the program. So that now that when you're recommended in January, you're recommended as a semi-finalist. Um, and when you receive the grant um, or you're offered the grant, you're, you're considered a finalist. And then when you actually take the grant, then you're considered a Fulbrighter. And one of the reasons we were able to do that, we were in the midst of uh, that other thing that goes on in March a lot of the times, and some of you know about that. Um, and so we thought if we could, if institutions can celebrate getting into the big dance uh, in the NCAA tournament, why aren't we doing that in terms of academics as well as athletics? And if everyone can talk about being part of the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight, we should also be able to talk about the ways in which our students are be able to move forward as semi-finalists in the Fulbright program and other prestigious awards as well as finalists. And even if things come up where their personal lives or they get an offer to do something else and they don't actually accept the, the award, um, they can always reapply. But we should also celebrate the fact that they made it that far. So it's the work that Laura and a lot of the other Fulbright program advisors uh, do around the country that has helped us continue to improve this program. So it's great for me to be here and sort of pay the visit back. Um, one thing I, I do want to uh, make sure that everybody's clear about so we completely dispel the myth that unlike the Rhodes, you know, that there's a pot of money out there, that there is a Rhodes Foundation, and that's how that uh, scholarship is funded. The Fulbright program um, is funded through an allocation by Congress to the State Department. Uh, the State Department uh, receives a, and, and basically sponsors the program and provides about 55% of the Fulbright funding worldwide. Uh, we get about another 35% from foreign governments. And then institutions of higher ed, your own institution, as well as institutions across the country and across the globe, contribute the other part, both in kind, uh, the work that you do um, in terms of uh, uh, helping to select and review applications here on campus, the work that faculty do as reviewers. And how many of the faculty here have ever been part of the National Screening Committee on the student side of the program where you've actually reviewed uh, some of the applications that come through. Has anybody? Great. We would love for more of you to be involved in that. We're always looking for more. So if you can volunteer some of your time uh, and contribute to, this, to the Fulbright program in that way, uh, please send me uh, a note and we will add your name into the database. We ask for roughly a three-year commitment. It doesn't have to be three consecutive years. So if you've got a sabbatical coming up or a teaching load that doesn't allow you to, to come for all three years in a row, that's okay. But it's a great way for you to get a better understanding about what's going on in the program, to see what strong applications look like, and how well that matches the kinds of students that you're having in the classroom. Um, if you've been part of the scholar program, you can also be a scholar reviewer for our DC office. And I would encourage you to, to, to do the same. 
So that's just a little bit about, uh, about the sponsor of the program. So please, there's no Fulbright Foundation out there with some magical pot of money. Does anyone know where the initial money came from, from the Fulbright program? Yeah? It was the, <laughs> the Senator Fulbright had a great idea after World War II to sell all the war surplus that we had overseas to our allies. And that we'd split the proceeds then, and they'd send us their students and scholars, and we'd send them the, uh, ours. And that's how we funded the program for the first 15 years, from 1946 to 1961. And then we had the Fulbright-Hayes Act that was uh, signed by, Senator, uh, by President Kennedy, which allowed now funding both from the US government and other governments. Okay. So just a sort of tip. What Laura said is spot on. The major goal of this program, unlike a lot of other things, is to actually promote mutual understanding and eventually, hopefully, get to world peace. And the reason I want to bring this up and, and emphasize this, we want you to be rock stars in the classrooms, where you're out doing research, you're in the libraries, you're out in the field. But the other thing is that you always have to remember, we also want you to be out there engaging with the host communities. So when I came on board, there was concern by the State Department about making sure that people get out and about. And they wanted to know how we could possibly do that. And I said, well, let's move from the tip section that we, we encourage people to, act, to talk about this. Let's make it a question on the application. So about three years ago, we added a question to the application asking you all to tell us about the ways in which you're going to engage with the host community. Please pay particular attention to that question. The Fulbright commissions and the US embassies, which oversee the program overseas, are very much concerned about having great people in the classroom and moving you know, forward in the terms of the research. But they also want to make sure that you're going to be that cultural ambassador for them. So don't punt on that question. Definitely don't leave it blank and really give it some good thought. Um, because that's overall what the, what, the, what the goal of the program is hoping to accomplish. IIE has been involved since the inception with this program in terms of the outreach and the selection process and some of the student monitoring. Uh, because IIE was founded in 1919 by a couple of Nobel Prize winners and, and all three of them, three gentlemen that were all connected to the higher ed community in the New York area with the idea in the wake of World War I that we need to have better communications and better understanding of one another. And so they created some programs for scholarship exchange and also for scholar rescue, especially in the wake of the Russian Revolution. So IIE has been doing these two things uh, for almost a, a century now, and, um, and we've continued to do so. So when the Fulbright program came on board, it was a natural for us to do the administration of that, and we're still involved in scholar rescue as well. So if you have, uh, if you're looking to maybe bring scholars, especially from Afghanistan, Iraq, or in Syria, out of harm's way and have them come to your campus, we have some funding that would help support that. We also have received some funding recently from the Mellon Foundation to bring artists. And since you have such a rich artist community here, um, if you'd like to find out more about that, um, if those of you who are faculty and administrators, please let me know about that as well. That's a little bit about what IIE does. In terms of eligibility, since all of you have almost been to this, it's pretty basic. US citizen, we have some US citizens here. Right? And it's a graduate program, so you have to have your bachelor's degree. And it's a student program, so you can't have your PhD when the time that you start the grant. So some of you who have just gotten there, so those are the faculty, if you're, you've got your PhD, we're going to talk about the scholar program. Other than that, there are no other eligibility requirements. There's some languages, we need to, but we can talk about that. But there's no GPA, max or minimums. And the reason I want to stress this is that sometimes people think, oh, if I'm not in honors, if I'm not on the dean's list, if I don't have some magical number next to my name, especially for my overall GPA, this is not the program for me. Remember, the program is about promoting mutual understanding. So if you started out in classics, and couldn't conjugate a Greek verb to save your life, but you now are living you know, part of organic chemistry, and that's really where your, where your bread and butter is, 
we don't care about that Greek grade. Right? Or if you joined the cross country team and ran yourself into the ground the first semester, and you finally got you know, into the debate club, and that's where you really could excel, we really don't care about those early grades either. We're only looking at the stuff that's going to be pertinent to the project that you're proposing. Okay? So take note of that. Tell your friends, too, just because they had a tough first semester or two doesn't mean it's the end of the world for them. Right? Any questions with regards to eligibility? Right? Great. And this also, if you're a US citizen, recent US citizen, that's OK, too. Just get it by the time you start your grant. Okay. Benefits. This is US government funding. You're not going to make money, money off of this, right? But we're not going to have you living out of a cardboard box, right? <laughs> Jennifer, was it OK? You had enough to get by? It was, yeah, yeah, it was OK, right? You weren't slumming it down in? I eat SIE every day. OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not going to come back with money in your pockets, but we're going to cover everything. And I know that's important, because the cost of higher ed today in, in the United States is skyrocketing, all right? We will also defer your student loans, so you don't have to worry about that, okay? So keep that in mind as well. They'll be put on hold. It's enough money for you to get by, and because you're going over, right, it's a cultural exchange linked to an academic vehicle, you're going over as a student. That means you can't be working over there and making money. So factor that in as well. Because we can't have international students coming over here and taking away American jobs, and we can't have Americans going overseas taking away international jobs. It doesn't work. But we can exchange ideas, right? And we can exchange people to no end. Okay. The program, as it looks today, at least, since I've been at IIE, which is about four years, the program has grown by 20%. When I came on board, we offered roughly 1,800 awards, and now we're offering over 2,100. I don't know of any other federal program that's grown by 20% in the last three or four years, given the government shutdown, sequester, and all the shenanigans that are going on in the DC area. So the reason I want to point this out, there's a lot more grants than there even were a couple of years ago. So there's a lot of opportunity. That's why I want you to go to the website and take a look at a lot of the new exciting awards that are out there and in different areas. And what you might have heard of even just a couple of years ago, for all of you who were listed on that, on that Fulbright list, it's even changed since then. Okay? So this just kind of gives you an idea where the growth is coming from. When I was an English teaching assistant back in 92, 93, there were 70 of these awards, and we were in four countries. And 40 of us were going to Germany. Now there are 70 other countries that want to have young, dynamic people coming to help improve the language speaking capabilities of their students and help them learn a little bit more about how Americans learn in the classrooms here. So that's a really big explosion side of the program. The other side, here, where we've seen the growth, is that international institutions want to partner with the Fulbright program. So now that there are a lot of Fulbright University of X awards. And part of this is driven by the fact that there's world rankings. And a factor of world rankings is how international your campus is. So they want to attract some of the best and the brightest from the United States to come to their universities, either to do research or even to do one year of coursework that might lead to a master's degree or in some institutions, um, even a two-year master's degree program. And so I just want to stop this a little bit and jump to the website to highlight that. So Taiwan, for example, just so you can kind of see this, there are five open awards. So any field, you can go anywhere you want. It's totally up to, up to, you, up to you. But now there are four universities that are offering special awards for two years, so you do well in the first year, you automatically have your grant renewed, and you can get a master's degree fully funded by the program in these fields at those top four universities in Taiwan. All of the curriculum, because it's international students, is taught in English. 
So if you know of somebody who's got that kind of background and that kind of interest in that part of the world, have them consider that. And this is just an example. Europe, we'll see it a lot more too with the Erasmus program and the growth of the Erasmus program. A lot of universities are partnering with Fulbright to do something very similar. The other side of the program, Taiwan in the last five years went from about 12 grants to now 81. So that's the kind of growth that's taking off in the Fulbright program overall, and I just use this as sort of a case study. So I would love to say that I had a magic wand and there was a database search engine so that you could put in, I want to do a master's in, I don't know, say economics. Where could I go? I was almost hoping I could say that at the beginning of the competition and March 31st when we opened that we have that. We don't. We're working on it. It's our top priority. So I'm sorry. You're still going to have to go country by country, page by page in order to see this or get the advice of Laura, who knows the website very, very well, to find out where you should go first. I promise you, we will have that for you next year to make it a little bit easier. So all of you who are sophomores, juniors, okay, it'll be a little bit easier for you down the road. Okay. All right, so I just want to pop back. So that's just, just an idea of, of where we're at. Okay. Laura, I want to talk a little bit about competitiveness. So I just want to kind of give you an idea of how things shake, shake down, basically, by world region at least. So we get about 10,000 applications. Last year, we were advertising just around 2,000 awards. This is how it shook out in terms of applications, at least by world region, to kind of give you an idea how competitive things are. So on average, obviously, for those of you who do math, 10 into 2 is about 1 in 5. But remember, this is country-based, right? So not even within world region, because remember with Europe, right? There's roughly about 900 awards, 45 or so are to the UK. And of these 5,000 people who applied, 1,000 of them applied for the UK. So if you take out the UK, we're down to 4,000, and we still have over 800 awards over in Europe. So your chances are pretty good. We do provide on the stats page of our website, so if I just pop back to that just to kind of give you an idea. So we have up in the top statistics. We do a breakdown just to kind of give you an idea about how competitive each country is. This is for the study research side. So if you have some interest or your research would take you to one of these countries, and you have an option about maybe going to a different country, just take a look to see how competitive it is. I wouldn't want to dissuade you from going to the place that you have your heart set on. Clearly, we have to give the money to somebody, and it might just as well be you. So pick the place that you're most passionate about. But if you have some choice and some flexibility, think about it, right? I, I look at, for example, even just with, between Austria, if you're in the German-speaking world, which is my background, right? If you have the Germans, you know, there versus Germany down here, does it make a difference for you? Okay. So this is, is on the study research side, it just happens to be for Europe, but we also have the, the stats that'll break down. If my magic button will work, and if not, okay. But it'll also do it on the ETA side as well. So you can kind of get for English teaching assistance and you can get a similar kind of idea of how things are and how competitive it is or not. So if I just scroll down a little bit, you can kind of get an idea, right? This is Taiwan, right? This is when we were only offering 68 awards. Now we're into the 80s. I don't think that numbers, you know, kind of, there's a, a kind of a correlation, but that gives you an idea. There was somebody who was Korea, somebody had in mind about going to Korea. You know, that those are, again, some of all of those options. So that just kind of gives you statistically how competitive things are or not. Right? So if you find that helpful, and don't, you know, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt at, at any point. Question? Yeah. Um, if, you're, if you think you're going to be funded in ETA, you also think you're going to be funded in study and research. Can you apply for both and see? 
Not in the same year, but yes, you can apply. Yeah. Not in the same year. You can only put your name in, in one hat. So you have to pick out which grant in which country. Yep. One at a time, but you can apply as many times as you want. And it, you know, on the, as we heard on the scholar side, and you can win as many times as you want. Yeah. I noticed some countries have, um, say, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, they had six grants, but none were given. Is there a reason for that? Some of that up there is, is looking at what happened either on the ground or the competitive nature of this thing. And so sometimes they move the money to a different region just because of, of how they felt that it was best allocated. OK? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. OK. All right. OK, so study research. Right? As I was kind of hinting at, the initial idea about the study research side of things was that you did your, how many are doing or plan to do a capstone project, a senior thesis, something that's heavily research based? Right? So the initial idea on the Fulbright program was you were going to go over as an independent researcher and continue whatever project you were doing, either at the undergraduate level or for those of you who are at the master's level, or if you're at the doctoral level, right, to go over and do that. So the idea was continue to doing something. So maybe, how many of you are actually, you know, citing uh, a scholar or scholarship that's outside of the United States, if you know that, yeah? How many of you have contacted those scholars or that institute and said, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm using your work in my capstone, master's thesis, doctoral work, it's really shaping the way I think about this problem. I may turn it into a Fulbright application and ask for your letter of support or letter of affiliation down the road. But in the meantime, thank you, thank you, thank you. So already, when you're starting to put together your research bibliographies, write to people. Let them know that you're interested. And you faculty, please tell your students to do that. If you've noticed that they're starting to cite scholars, start to have them build that international relationship so that they know down the road, it's like, oh yeah, I know of somebody who's overseas. And if they can't do it, right, then you can do a follow-up when you've actually got maybe a paragraph in terms of an abstract of your proposal. You can go to them and say, this is what my abstract looks like. This is what I'm proposing. Would you be around? Or do you know of a colleague of yours who might be able to support my research project? The sooner you do that, the better you're going to build that relationship, the stronger their letter is going to be, and the more that you can talk about the ways in which you built that relationship. Because remember, the overall goal is about promoting mutual understanding. So if you've already taken that initiative right, and done that, that's a great step forward. So that was the original side of how the research program was going to work. So the idea was we're going to give you the resources. And as you saw from the grant benefits, if you need equipment or materials, we don't pay for that. Apply for some other things. And one of the places that you can go to apply, and I know it's on your website, the ieepassport.org has a list of not only all the study abroad opportunities, so that's ieepassport.org, all one word. That gives you a list of all the study abroad opportunities. And then there's another database next to it with a big dollar sign with all the funding mechanisms. And that goes for both students and scholars, by the way. So for fun, I always type in Germany just to see how many opportunities are out there for, you know, for everybody. It's like 137, uh, which is great. Okay. So, you want to think about that. So the idea was do your research, continue on, and the person who's going to be your advisor over there or who's going to be, the, it's going to be the, the person who's going to basically open up doors for you, get you access to information or resources that might be helpful to move your research project along. In your case, it was right, get you to the, the butterflies. Like, where are the butterflies? Help me find the butterflies, right? right. How hard was it for you to find uh, a, a letter of support? It was extremely easy. I was already involved in an existing project, and so I asked some collaborators and they said, of course, please. Yeah. So it can be that easy. It can be a natural extension. It might also be that, you know what? I've done my, my senior thesis, my capstone project, my master's. I am burnt. I don't want to do that. I've always been interested in this other side project. That's OK, too. You can apply for that. 
I know somebody, when I was over there, they, their project was to explore the ways in which the town square was different in the east versus the west. And they went around, took pictures of the town squares in small cities in Germany. That was their project. That sounds like a pretty cool idea, right? And it's important, right? I mean, your little town square is gorgeous, right? And she picked like any town that was something like less than 20,000 that had a traditional town square. How did it change? Was it rebuilt? Was it rebuilt more in the west and the east? What did they do in the east? And blah, blah, blah. Had nothing to do with her capstone project. She just thought she had a little town square in her hometown in upper New England. And she thought, oh yeah, the commons. You know, like Boston Commons? I wonder how that's changed in the East. Just an interesting idea. That's Fulbright. OK? So don't think that you just have to, it has to be straight academics. Remember, it's a cultural exchange. Think beyond those little boxes. OK? All right? So if you're going to boot, remember, it's also it's an international program. So in terms of putting together your, your project and your statement here, you really want to think about why I can't do this in the United States. So the butterflies are only in Brazil, right? That's an easy sell. Or the soil samples are there. Or this faculty member, or this department, or this lab, or this technique. Those are easy ones. Or the town squares. Right? So it's an international scholarship for an academic year. So propose something that you're not going to be able to accomplish just in the summer, but do not, and this is the biggest thing that most people do, especially you younger people, is you're really ambitious and you really want to rewrite the fall of the Roman Empire in nine months. <laughs> don't. Listen to the advice that you get from faculty. Don't, don't bite off more than you can chew in those nine months. The more detailed and the more depth that you can have is often the better rule of thumb. And remember, the places that you're going to may not be as accessible or have the resources that you have here in Tennessee. Some places may not have electricity or an open library or whatever you need. I mean, make sure you're doing your homework so what you're proposing is realistic and feasible. Right? That's the biggest thing. If you can do that on the research projects, you're well ahead of a lot of people. Now, and what I'm saying here in terms of academic record, I don't care about your overall GPA. I'm only asking you to tell us about the coursework that you've done as preparation for the project that you're proposing. So if what you did right in your drama class wasn't all that spectacular because you couldn't act, and it has nothing to do with butterflies in Brazil, we don't care, right? But we really want to see is what are the things that you've done that indicate that you're properly prepared, one, and two, that you'll be successful in the year that you're over there. That's what we're looking for in terms of your academic and professional achievements. So keep that in mind, right? Leadership. When you're are part of all the extracurriculars that you are involved in, whether it's here on campus or off campus or the opportunities that your professors may give to you, try to step forward and don't just say, I'm a member of X club. You don't need to be president. You don't need to have senior role necessarily. But lead a project. Take an initiative. Demonstrate to us that when you get overseas, you're going to get out and about and engage with people. And that you're not going to be the wallflower. Even if you're an introvert a little bit like me, and I mean introvert in the way that I reju rejuvenate more by being alone and going running in the woods than I would necessarily by standing up with all of you. But find ways that you can step forward and make sure that you've shown that you've been able to do that here so we can be confident that you'll do that over there. Okay. Language. How many have already started or have some foreign language to the country that they're going to, possibly? Great. You're well ahead of where I was at. 
So I was just telling the group earlier here, I majored in English and philosophy. I minored in classics. I went to Germany. <laughs> I didn't take a German class in undergrad. Okay. And the reason I tell that is that if you've got some language, great. You're well ahead of a lot of people. Remember, you're applying. The national deadline is October the 11th this year, or for later on, and they'll be in the fall. You're not going until the following fall. Or if you're going to some parts of the country, you're not going until January or February the following year. So you've got 12, 14, 15 months. So if you don't have language skills that are on par with where you are like to be, tell us about your plans to get there between now and then. And especially if you're going to maybe a country where you're, the language isn't taught here, don't just go, oh, we don't have that class, so I don't have any language capability. Poor me. We've got the internet. You've got library resources. You've got lots of different ways. Maybe there's a native language speaker here that you can say, I, I learned how to get directions, where the bathroom is, how to order some food, what the basic rituals are, if it's tea is important to that country, or coffee, or whatever, or sports. Again, demonstrate some leadership and show how you've taken the initiative to say, I got Rosetta Stone, and I'm through level one. Or I'm meeting a native speaker, and I at least can make sure that I can get around, and I can be that cultural ambassador. And this is my plan then to go forward. So I've been able to accomplish this amount already, I want to do this over the next year or so, and by the time I hit the ground, I'm going to be ready. Okay? So just because you don't have the language doesn't mean anything. Right? So, so keep that in mind as well. And then finally, the community engagement. This doesn't mean that you need to, to, to found some new organization over there. right? You might want to join something that's culturally relevant. One of the ways that somebody that was an ETA, an English teaching assistant in Malaysia, he thought his way of engaging everybody was teaching them how to play dodgeball. <laughs> he taught fifth graders. There was a little tournament among the seven schools that were in the neighborhood. His school won, because clearly, you know, he had <laughs> trained them, <laughs> made the paper. That's his contribution. That's community engagement. Some of you sing. Some of you are in the equestrian stuff. Some of you do, I don't know, you're involved working with the elderly or those who are disadvantaged or disabled or, you know, I don't know. Whatever you do here, figure out a way in which it might be culturally relevant to the community to which you might want to go and see how that might work. You may be joining a church choir or some sort of dance or photography. I don't know. But I just throw out the dodgeball thing. I taught them how to play baseball. You know? so that was a lot of fun. Um, and so just think about what's, what, what do you do that you're passionate about that you could transfer that would be appropriate. Okay? And that's how we can think about it. All right? Now, the last thing is go to the website. There's a whole tip section about, you know, who, the what, the where, the how, the why, et cetera, that you want to go through, what to avoid, and things like that. I'm not going to go through that because it's actually on our website. But those are the things that I think are really helpful. The flip side of this, so that was more on the research, right? The study part, as I was saying, is, and we've got a whole tip section about this too, and this is brand new. We never had this before, but because of the number of opportunities for you to just do coursework, for a full year, or in some cases two years, leading to a master's degree, or at least you know, a that, that possibility, is also important. So tell us about why you want to go study with this particular university and this particular department. Hopefully you've been you know, maybe reading about this particular department or program. You can even go right in American studies, but you want to have the Asian perspective on American studies, or American politics, or the American Constitution, right? 
How do others perceive us? And what would you bring to the classroom by being an American and being in the minority talking about your primary system overseas? You would be a valuable asset. So when you're writing this type of application, think about it. Why, why do I need to go over? What did they offer that's not being done here in the United States? Tell us that story and make sure you're reaching out to the faculty or the chairs of those departments and getting an idea of what kind of courses are going to be taught. Tell us specifically about the courses that you would plan to take if they're posted. And if they're not posted, and a lot of institutions don't do that as far in advance as you would like. You can say, I've seen the courses that have been offered in the past. Traditionally, these are the kinds of things that are available in the fall or in the spring semester, and this is what I would look forward to doing. Or I've already contacted the faculty who have taught that, and they have told me that this will be offered. Okay. Great. On the ETA side of things, a couple of things that's, that are important. You're going over as an assistant initially, right? So there is the possibility, and the reason I throw this out there, for those of you who might want to do, in some, in some cases, they act, there some countries will ask you, tell us about the side project that you would like to do, and maybe based on some of your research. So some of you want to maybe continue with some research, or maybe take a class. You don't know exactly where you're going to be placed, but you say, you can write in your application, if I were to be placed, near a university, I'd like to take a course. That's what I did. So once a week, I, I hopped on the train and went into Munich and took a, a one-day-a-week you know, one you know, one seminar, and that worked out really well. Other people have a research project that might be in the arts. So if you have artistic friends who want to work on some, some of their artistic skills, this is a great way to basically, instead of waiting tables, you're teaching English, and you can still work on your creative writing, your photography, or whatever it is. Okay? And maybe you can hook up with somebody who is in a master's class or whatever it is that's going on there. So tell that either to yourself or to some of your friends who are in, in that kind of way. All right? You do not need to be an English major. You do not have to study English as a second language necessarily. We are asking you to be great communicators. So faculty, if you have great communicators in your classroom, people who really know how to present and are comfortable standing up and conveying information, and if you're not that person in the classroom, but you're great in terms of your student organization, and you know how to convey information to the next group that's coming through, or you do that at your church, or you're a camp counselor, or whatever it is, you are a great facilitator of information, then think about, about applying for, as an ETA. That's what we're primarily looking for. Because you're going to some remote parts of the world sometimes, and remote parts within, that, within those countries, and we're asking you to be a great communicator and not only improve the English speaking skills, but we're also asking you to rep represent the ways in which you know, American students learn today. That's much less teacher-centered, it's all about group dynamics and group work, and therefore you can come in. And the other thing is, you may think that you're going to be going over there working on pronunciation, but something like the primary happens, and all that goes out the window, and you're just giving lectures about the electoral college and delegates and how this whole thing works. And I was there in 92, 93 when Ross Perot, instead of Donald Trump, and another Clinton were running, and another Bush. And that's all I did, was explain the electoral college system. <laughs> Do you know how the electoral college people are elected, selected, nominated in your state? And is it the same in all your neighboring states? It's different, right? Just as we're learning all about the whole delicate stuff. So be really flexible about that. You may be teaching the AP class for Shakespeare, or you may have a chance to, to have them read a couple of stories, um, in, my, in my case, because I went to the same school that Garrison Keillor started Lake Wobegon. I brought in some of his, his stories as well. But you're really just communicating. That's all it is. Okay? Great. So be very, very flexible, adapting, and all of that. What you're primarily doing in your essay is 
indicating how you can convey information clearly and provide some examples of that. There will be some countries, and we have a whole list, where, where because you're teaching at the higher level, at the university level, we may ask you to have a, some more credentials. And we list that out there so you know. But if you like working with younger people, pick that country. If you have some language skills, you can, you, your options are opened a little bit more. So there's lots of, uh, lots of possibilities about that. And then the other thing is you know, that you're only there for 20 to 30 hours. What else are you going to do to engage with your community? Talk about that. All right. And then go to the tip sections for this. Any questions with regards to the ETAs? Anyone interested? Do people kind of have an idea whether or not they're going to be on the study research side of things so far from what they've heard, study researchers? Yeah? And some English teaching assistants? OK. All right. Great. OK, I'm going to kind of slide on a little bit more. What we're looking for here, it's pretty straightforward. If you've been on the website, anybody actually started an application yet? Just for fun, you know, you can do that. I've, I've always got a dummy application going, uh, just to kind of to see how it all works. Right? So if you're on the study research side, we give you two pages to tell us about that project or about those courses that you'd like to, to push together or into possibly a, you know, a, a master's degree. The overall, don't go, as you'll see in the tip section, don't go into the heavy jargon. You know, if you've got some, just like a well-educated person, what they're going to be able to get. What, what is it, what's compelling about this particular project? We don't necessarily have to be new and innovative and you're going to win, an, you know, some, some, some genius award because of this. So it can be follow-up. It can be you're joining a research group, right? And they need another body. And you're interested in the butterflies in Brazil. That's fine, right? So talk about that in terms of that arc. And if you've been in contact with people over there, tell us a little bit about that, too. On the ETA side, tell us about how you're going to be able to handle situations in particular when you're conveying information, because a number of the classrooms are not going to be like this. So when you're looking at how you're going to, to choose that country, right? Were, was, was your classroom like this? Yeah. No. Yeah, it was just open, but yes, yeah, it was a college. Yeah, so again, when you're looking at the, the types of places that you're going to, you can tell about whether or not you're going to be with the teacher's college, or if you're going to be working with fifth graders, and if you're going to be working with fifth graders, are you going to be a place like in, in Taiwan, where they're going to have more resources, or are you going to be in some remote area of Malaysia? And find the places where you're going to be comfortable, and you're going to really excel. Okay. The personal statement, was that the hardest thing for all of you who have written personal statement? Was that the hardest thing to write? Yeah. Writing about ourselves in a way that's authentic, that's not too boastful, but is not putting all of your accomplishments behind some veiled you know, what I call the Midwestern nice, where you never actually talk about yourself, it's really hard to get out there. I would expect that you will need to do five, six, or more drafts to find the kernel of who you are. As a recommendation, if you don't like to write, use your phone and just record ideas, different snippets about your intellectual biography, about why you're interested in this particular country and culture. And you don't need to go way back to when you saw a movie or you had your first bit of mango and sticky rice at the Thai restaurant. <laughs> you can mention that maybe you know, in, a, in some parenthetical statement along the way, but talk about the big things, too that got you going. Maybe there was an international student. Maybe there was a lecture. Maybe there was, maybe you did some traveling earlier, but just got introduced, and now you'd like to further explore. This is the most challenging thing to write is about ourselves, 
but if you start at this right now, you're going to be having to do this a lot down the road. So the earlier you begin, the better. And that's why all of you who did Gilman and, and the critical language scholarships, the stuff that you can start doing earlier. And that's also why I'm thrilled that Middle Tennessee State offers scholarships for the study abroad so you can start practicing. The earlier you begin this, the easier it's going to become. As I mentioned, I'm from this tiny little town in rural Minnesota. The regional supervisor of the Minneapolis Star and Tribune, the paper that I used to deliver, nominated me to go to an international camp in upstate New York when I was 15 years old. And that's the first time I had to write about myself, about picking rocks in the summer and detasseling corn and doing all those crazy things. And, and when I received that scholarship, I came back after spending eight weeks. There's 25 of us from the United States and 25 from around the world. I thought, if the Minneapolis Star and Tribune is going to give me money to do something like that, who else is out there? And it's amazing how much money there is and money that's left on the table. Even the Fulbright program, we left money on the table last year because not enough people applied or not enough qualified people applied. I hate that. I hate going back and saying we didn't spend all the money we should have. But a lot of it is because people have a hard time articulating why they want to go personally. And because, as Laura said, this is so much about you being that cultural ambassador, this is, is as important and sometimes more than necessarily this. So start working on this now. And I can't, I guess, in, in stress that enough. Start writing or recording or however you do it to get those little gems that are going to make you stand out. You only get one page. It's not a lot of words, and that's really hard. OK? The references here, pick three different people who can talk a little bit more about who you are. So if you're doing the research side, right? Have your advisor on your capstone or your thesis, whether it's at the bachelor, the doctoral, or the master's level. Have someone who can talk about your abilities in the classroom, maybe. And then have somebody else who can talk about you being that cultural ambassador. And it may not even be a faculty member. right? It may be the advisor of your student organization. It may be you know, the head of your parish or whatever it is that you do. We don't get a chance to interview you. You get a chance to do that here on the campus, but those who are and, you know, when, you get, when it comes to my office, we just get a, another report. So the more little stones we can put together, puts together a better picture of this mosaic of who you are. So have faculty members who are going to write about different things. And while you can't see those letters to see what they actually write, you can suggest, I am asking so-and-so to write, and I'm hoping that they're going to talk about this. And I'm going to ask so-and-so, another person, to write about that. And therefore, I'd like you, if, you're, if you think this is good, that you would write about something along these lines. You're not going to, you know, faculty will do what faculty do, which is whatever they want. But you can help guide them along the way. And that can be really helpful. And don't pick people who necessarily have the biggest titles behind their names. It doesn't have to be the chair of the department or the deans or anybody else like that. Pick the people who know you best. Right? And faculty, if, if you don't know them well, even if you're the big head honchos in your department, but you don't know them well enough, really advise them to go to somebody else with whom they've worked. It makes a big difference whether or not we're seeing sort of a formula letter on the one side, or we're seeing somebody who's really writing about that individual. So think about that, right? And again, especially if you're on the research side, we should have at least two that are on the academic side, and one can be on the outside, right? On the ETA side, it might be just one who's an academic, and two that are talking about you as being that great communicator. And again, that's not to say that you can't have all three be academics. But again, we want to make sure that you're spreading across you know, the, the background about who you are in that way. Language, we've talked a little bit about this. You know, go to your faculty here. 
and then also not only get an assessment about where you're at now, but we give you some space. So talk about your plan about how you're going to move forward. And if you can't fit it all in that space, then when you do your campus interview with Laura and the team, they've got space to write about that as well. So they can add more to that, and so we can get a better idea about how you're going to be able to improve your language along the way. Okay. Transcripts, we do not need official transcripts. So it's not going to cost you anything to upload, hopefully, unofficial transcripts at the beginning. We really want to make this as zero cost as possible. Okay, with regards to that. Then these letters of affiliation, I just want to talk a little bit about that. I mentioned if you're doing the research, if you've got already some contacts, if you're citing somebody, if you are not citing somebody, then reach out to your faculty advisor or somebody and say, hey, is there somebody else that I should be including on this list? Or is there somebody else who's doing something that's comparable? I may not actually incorporate that into my capstone, senior thesis, et cetera. But I know that there are other people who are doing similar work. That's a great way to reach out to them. Right? So either you can be doing that, you can be doing some searches. The other way to do this is to go to the directory. So as you saw at the beginning, there's the student directory that'll tell you all of the students who have gone to any country. And you can go by institution. You can go by country. You can go by field of study. You can go by years. You can do all those kinds of searches there. So maybe contact a recent alum from the country and the field into which you're looking and say, hey, who did you work with? And they might be interested in then doing follow-up, right? Because you were part of a project that's still going on. They're looking for the next person, right? Another, And remember, you're going over fully funded. So they don't have to pay for you, right? Faculty here, if some visiting scholar right, or student was coming in on the Fulbright program and coming to your department and working on a research project for you and they had full funding, would you like, oh no, I'm not sure. <laughs> really, you know? And then they're vetted by the Fulbright program, right? So you got both things going for you, right? Fully funded and you got Fulbright attached to your name. Who's gonna say no, right? So keep that in mind when you're reaching out. The other side, of course, is you can go on the visiting student side. And they have their own website with their own database. So you can talk about all the students who have come here and have benefited from the Fulbright program and studying this field. And you can say, hey, who was your mentor back in your home country? And since they've already been part of the Fulbright program, and their whole idea is to promote mutual understanding, they're most likely going to say, hey, yeah, sure, I'll introduce you to so-and-so. On the scholar side, they also have a directory of both US and visiting. So look at the recent scholars who have come back from a variety of countries and see if they could possibly put you in contact with somebody or any of the seven or 800 visiting scholars who came to the United States. Again, do your research. And that can really help connect everybody together. All right? That's what I would re really highly recommend as, as a great resource. And remember, if you're doing an ETA, you don't have to worry about that because the Fulbright program will place you at the particular institution, that, whether it's a high school, university, et cetera, that you might be working at. All right? So that's all I really wanted to say in terms of about applying. Um, everything is online, so there's no paper needed. Just upload everything you've got. You've got your on-campus. Laura, do you want to talk about the on-campus deadlines? Because I can tell you. Um, the on-campus deadline is uh, September uh, 1st. And uh, the Fulbright is open now. So it, everything is open. Uh, what I usually tell students is, you know, you can wait until after finals to contact me. So uh, finals are coming. So if you are interested in the Fulbright program, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, I think you all have it because I've been emailing you, but it's laura.clifford uh, at mtsu.edu. We can meet either in person or by phone or by Skype and start the application process. So uh, the sooner, the better. So if you know you're going to apply for the Fulbright, um, please don't wait till September 4th and contact me. <laughs> please uh, start your application in May. And I just want to point out a couple of things. 
it's the Fulbright U.S. Student Program, but it doesn't mean you have to be currently enrolled. Correct. So if you know of some older students or some former students who are out working, but they're thinking about you know, coming back, or they, now they've really got an idea of what they would like to do, or now they really feel like they're mature enough to be an English teaching assistant, um, let them know that they apply. About 30% of the people who submit applications are not currently enrolled. We would encourage you, or you would encourage those, to go back through their alma maters, because then they can get the, the eyes on that and the people who are going to review those applications and provide feedback. So it's not a big surprise. Those who apply through their institutions statistically do better than those who apply at large. And it's not because we prefer people who are applying from institutions. It's just that they've had more eyes on their applications. So please let people know about that. Okay? The other thing that I just want to throw out there is that this program, just to sort of pull it back full circle, was proposed by Senator Fulbright in the wake of World War II. And in the original policies, preference was given to those who had served in the military. So if you have people who are coming back through the new GI Bill that Senator Webb pushed through, and you have more of those people, if all things are equal, preference is given to those who have served. Okay? That still holds true today. Okay? So let, let people know if you know that they've served. The other thing is, is that the State Department has additional funding for, to accommodate uh, anyone with disabilities. So I know that your institution has done a great job of finding ways to support everyone uh, and so that they can succeed on this campus. And sometimes people self-select out because they don't think that they're going to find those kinds of resources when they go away. And just to know that the State Department has additional funding, whether you need animals, dogs, translators, commute, you know, sort of commuter commitment or co computer equipment or anything along those lines, the State Department has those resources available. So if you can make sure that people are not self-selecting out because they don't think they're going to have that, please let them know that that's not the case. And finally, I'd just love for you to be able to go back out and tell five of your friends or colleagues who you think would not have ever come to an information session about something that's dealing with anything international. If you can tweet them, text them, email them, Facebook them, whatever it is, just five of them, and just say, I was at an info session about the Fulbright program, and then just put dollar signs next to it, <laughs> I'd be forever grateful. Thank you so much. <laughs>